Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Episode 60 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the apparition of La Salette. I'm Dom Bethanelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Before we get into today's episode, I do want to recommend something to the listeners. Uh, another show on the SQPN Network called American Catholic History. If you like Mysterious World, you might like that uh, that podcast too. It's a weekly podcast, about 10 minutes at most each week, where Tom and Noel Crow, our hosts, they get, tell you something, uh, usually a little known person or a series of events from history of the Catholic Church in the United States, in American Catholic history. So go check it out. Uh, people are loving it. We hear so many good things about it. Uh, it's really caught, caught fire. It's we're still in the early episodes of that. It's only been out for a few months, so you could quick. It's only ten less than ten minutes, so you could quickly catch up on all the episodes if you wanted. It's at sqpn.com slash history. So please go check that out. You'll probably like that if you like this podcast. Today we're we're going to talk about the apparition of La Salette on September nineteenth, eighteen forty six, which is one hundred and seventy three years ago today. Two French children reported an apparition of the Virgin Mary. She gave warnings about what would happen if people did not repent. She also gave each of the children a secret, and these were sent to Pope Pius IX. Eventually, the local bishop approved the apparition, but controversy surrounded it, and that controversy has continued. And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Yeah. So, Jimmy, where is La Salette? It's a village in southeastern France, and in 1846, when the apparition occurred, there were around 700 inhabitants. Today, there are fewer than 70, so it's like a tenfold decrease in population since then. Right, very common in the, the, the outlying areas, the decrease yeah. in population in the villages. Yes, yeah, the process of citification, yes. people moving to cities has been happening all over the world. Uh, what was France like at the time? The French Revolution was over, but there was a lot of conflict in the country, particularly over how it should be ruled. When the apparition occurred in 1846, it was toward the end of what is known as the July Monarchy, uh, which lasted from 1830 to 1848. So there was a king at this time. However, less than two years later, Republican rule was restored and tensions between the royalists and the Republicans remained high for decades. All right. So that's the the, the situation that we're uh, concerned with. Who were the visionaries? The, the older one was a girl named Melanie Calvat. You'll also see her referred to as as Melanie Matthew. And she was 15 at the time. She was born in 1831. The other was a boy named Maximin Girard. And I have to say, this is a f- episode with French names. So, you know, caveat emptor, uh, my <laughs> pronunciation. The, he was 11 at the time. He was born in 1835. They were both shepherds, or actually they were both cowherds. They were tending cows. And that's similar to the later apparition at Fatima, Portugal, where you had the children who saw it were were shepherds. Both of them were very uneducated, like Maximin could not read or write. I don't know if Melanie could, but Maximin could not at this time. They also didn't know each other until like two days before the event. Hmm. And then they met two days before the event, and then they had this event. So what happened during the apparition? The Catholic Encyclopedia article on La Salette, which was published in 1910, so, you know, not even a century after the event, it has a concise account. On 19 September 1846, about three o'clock in the afternoon, in full sunlight, on a mountain about 5,918 feet high, and about three miles distant from the village of La Salette, Falavo, it is related that two children beheld in a resplendent light a beautiful lady clad in a strange costume. Speaking alternately in French and in Patois, she charged them with a message which they were to quote, deliver to all her people, end quote. After complaining of the impiety of Christians, and threatening them with dreadful chastisements in case they should persevere in evil, 
She promised them the divine mercy if they would amend. Finally, it is alleged, before disappearing, she communicated to each of the children a special secret. Yeah, and it should be noted that in this case, she only appeared the one time, uh, at least as far as what was reported, although there are some indications she may have appeared later, but that's not part of the public narrative. The kids never admitted to seeing her again, although they kind of maybe hinted at it. But unlike Fatima, it's, it wasn't come back here every month and I'll appear to you. It was just this is a one time deal. Also, we should probably mention for people who may not be familiar, Patois is it, it, the article says she spoke alternately in French and Patois. Patois is not a language. Patois is a like a local dialect. Yeah. So it's not the king's French. It's just the way it's spoken in this local village. So each local area will have its own Patois that is a variant on the national language. And so the kids kind of understood French, but not really well. What they really spoke was their own village's patois. And so like Melanie, for example, didn't know when the apparition used the French word for potato, which is like pomme de terre. She didn't know what that was. She thought it might mean an apple or something. Right. Because which it literally means. Yeah, yeah. Apple of the earth. She didn't know it meant a potato. Yeah, uh, in a time before mass media, the languages were much more fractured uh, because people also didn't travel as much. So languages got very local. Yeah. So what were these chastisements that the apparition warned the children about? There were two particular sins that the Virgin Mary mentioned on this occasion. One was failing to properly observe Sundays. People were doing a lot of work and business on Sundays. They had their their shops open and stuff. And even these kids rarely got to mass because they were having to work. On Sundays, they were tending the cows or whatever. The other was swearing in a way that involved Jesus's name. That is profanity in the proper sense. You, If you treat God's name as an unsacred thing, then you are profaning it. This is different than vulgarity. Vulgarity is using like bathroom words and things like that. The F word, the S word, things right. like that. Those are vulgarity, but they're not profanity because they don't misuse God's name. Right. So basically, it's the second and third commandment that uh, that she's warning people against violating here. The or the third and fourth, depending on how you number the commandments. But in the Catholic Church, they're grouped in such a way that this would be the second and third commandment. The Virgin Mary indicated that if people didn't repent, there would be a famine involving the failure or spoilage of multiple crops, including potatoes, wheat, walnuts and grapes. So then what happened after the apparition? Well, there was a big controversy over it. The Catholic Encyclopedia explains the sensation caused by the recital of Melanie and Maximum was profound and gave rise to several investigations and reports. Monsignor Philibert de Bruyard, Bishop of Grenoble, appointed a commission to examine judicially this marvelous event. The commission concluded that the reality of the apparition should be admitted. Soon, several miraculous cures took place on the mountain of La Salette and pilgrimages to the place were begun the miracles needless to say was ridic the, the miracle itself needless to say was ridiculed by free thinkers but it was also questioned among the faithful and especially by ecclesiastics there arose against it in the diocese of grenoble and lyon a violent opposition aggravated by what is known as the incident of ours as a result of this hostility and the consequent agitation monsignor de Bruyard, on 16 november 1851 declared the apparition of the Blessed Virgin as certain and authorized the cult of Our Lady of La Salette. This act subdued but did not suppress the opposition, whose leaders, profiting by the succession in 1852 of a new bishop, Monsignor Genouillac <laughs> to Monsignor Briard, who had resigned, retaliated with violent attacks on the reality of the miracle of La Salette. They even asserted that the beautiful lady was a young woman named La Merlière, which story gave rise to a widely advertised suit for slander. Despite these hostile acts, the first stone of a great church was solemnly laid on the Mount of La Salette, 25 May 1852, amid a large assembly of the faithful. This church, later elevated to the rank of a basilica, was served by a body of a religious called Missionaries of La Salette. In 1891, diocesan priests re replaced these missionaries driven into exile by persecuting laws. 
Right, because France has, in the last, since the French Revolution, has had a problem with religious liberty being denied to, to Catholics in, and others in the country. I should mention for people who aren't Catholic or who aren't as familiar with some of these terms, when it says the local bishop authorized the cult of Our Lady of La Salette, that doesn't mean what you might think based <laughs> on the modern meaning of cult. He didn't like authorize a group of people to form a cult and worship Mary. In this case, what cult, this is an older usage of the word cult that's not part of standard English these days. It means basically the veneration. So he authorized people to show respect for the Virgin Mary as she appeared at La Salette. So said, this is this is an okay apparition. If you want to venerate Mary under the title Our Lady of La Salette, you can do that. This shrine is still there today, and we'll have a link to the website for it. It has a section in English. Also, in at the same t- same year as the shrine was founded, 1852, the bishop approved that congregation that was mentioned, uh, the La Salette missionaries, and they're still around as well. Yep. In fact, uh, there is a very large La Salette shrine with the La Salette missionaries uh, not more than 20 minutes, half an hour of my house here. And oh. every year they have a wonderful Christmas display. Uh, I was do. just going to ask if it was the one with the famous Christmas display of lights. Yes, yeah. it, it's really great. I bring the kids there every year. So, uh, uh-huh. But but uh, yes, they're still around. Now, you mentioned that the Virgin Mary reportedly gave each of the children a secret. What do we know about that? Well, we know quite a bit today because in recent years, the texts of the original secrets were rediscovered in the Vatican archives. For a long time, they were lost and they were not made public at the time. In 1910, for example, not a lot was known about them because they had been sent to Pius IX and were just in an archive somewhere and nobody knew where they were. Nobody had read them in decades, probably. But the Catholic Encyclopedia gave a basic account of how the secrets came to be written down because that was known. These two secrets, which neither Melanie nor Maximin ever made known to each other, were sent by them in 1851 to Pius IX on the advice of the local bishop, Monsignor de Bruyard. It is unknown what impressions these mysterious revelations made on the Pope, for on this point there were two versions diametrically opposed to each other. Maximin's secret is not known, for it was never published. Melanie's was inserted in its entirety in a brochure which she herself had printed in 1879 at Lecce, Italy, with the approval of the bishop of that town. A lively controversy followed as to whether the secret published in 1879 was identical with that communicated to Pius IX in 1851, or in its second form, it was not merely a work of the imagination. The latter was the opinion of wise and prudent persons who were persuaded that a distinction must be made between the two Melanies, between the innocent and simple voyant of 1846 and the visionary of 1879, whose mind had been disturbed by reading apocalyptic books and the lives of Illuminati. As Rome uttered no decision, the strife was prolonged between the disputants. Most of the defenders of the text of 1879 suffered censure from their bishops. And it should also be pointed out that the 1879 book, as well as a later edition, was eventually placed on the index of forbidden books by the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So they said, take this out of circulation. The faithful are not to be reading this. It is not safe. So apart from this, what happened to the children after the event? Maximin traveled to many places. He tried a number of careers. He went to seminary to see about being a priest, but he dropped out because he couldn't keep up with his studies. His dad had mentioned, for example, that as a boy, he was so kind of hyperactive. He didn't really study, and he only got him to learn the Our Father and the Hail Mary after a lot of effort. So he was not suited to all of the academic work one needs to become a priest. He started studying medicine, but, you know, he kind of got a study to be a doctor. So um, he, he didn't pass the state medical examinations, and he ended up working in a pharmacy for a while. He then went to Rome and enlisted in the Papal Zouaves, which was kind of like, they're not the Swiss Guard, but they're a, a military force that the Pope had at the time for the defense of the Papal States and the Vatican and things like that. And he did well there, but he didn't stay there. So he quit being a soldier, came back to France. A family named Jourdain paid off his debts, which he had incurred. And in 1869, he entered a partnership with a liquor dealer. So he became a liquor salesman, but reportedly was defrauded by the guy and didn't make any money. 
1870, he was drafted into the French Imperial Army. In 1875, at age 39, he died in his native village of Cor in France. Okay, and then what happened to Melanie? The La Salette Missionaries Religious Order has a summary on their website. She resided four years with the Sisters of Providence. Her memory was poor, and she had still less aptitude for study than Maximin. As early as November 1847, her directress feared, quote, that the celebrity that had been thrust upon her might make her conceited, end quote. Unfortunately, Melanie then took to lending a willing ear to troubled and sick individuals, to people whose minds were obsessed with popular prophecies, pseudo-apocalyptic and pseudo-mystical theories. This would affect her for the rest of her life. To give credence to her pronouncements, she linked them to the secret she had received from the beautiful lady. Unfortunately, Melanie pursued her prophetic meanderings. Later, these were orchestrated by the blazing talent of a Leon Bloy and would become a Melanist movement, allegedly stemming from La Salette, but lacking any foundation except the unverifiable pronouncements of Melanie. The message Melanie attempts to link to La Salette during this period has nothing whatever in common with the testimony she gave about the apparition in the early years. When the conversation returns to the events of September 19, 1846, she reverts without fail to the simplicity and the clarity of her early narrative, which agrees with that of Maximin. So notice what the La Salette missionaries, and these guys are, you know, committed to this apparition. This is the basis of their order. But look at what they're saying. Melanie did not have a stable life after the apparition. According to her directress, she was in danger of becoming conceited because of her celebrity. She reportedly began making new prophetic claims and to justify them said, oh, that's what the lady told me in the secret. And apart from amplifying the secret, she, although apart from that amplification of the original secret, she did maintain the same basic account of what happened. You know, we saw the lady, she warned us about this and that. It's just the secret that seems to get expanded. In addition to the La Salette missionary statement, we should note several other things. Melanie entered religious life in 1850 at the age of 20, but she didn't remain in the same religious order. Uh, I don't have a full exact count, but it appears she was at different times a member of at least five orders with additional transfers between monasteries. So she, it's not like she settled down in one monastery and stayed there or even had a single transfer to another monastery. She was she was moving around through different religious orders and religious houses. Part of the reason for that is be, she became involved in French politics. She was a royalist and opposed the Republican government that came into power. She also alleged that there was a Masonic plot to harm the church and to harm France, which, you know, she's actually right about that. She had, though, repeated conflicts with bishops, and she spent her last years not living in a religious order. She was out of the convent, and she was just living as an anonymous woman in Altamura, Italy. And she was known by the locals as, oh, yeah, that's that French woman. She, we see her at Mass. But she wasn't living as a religious, and she was then found dead in her home in 1904 at age 73. So what theories are there about this? The two basic theories one normally confronts in an apparition are, okay, it's either a genuine heavenly, heavenly apparition, or it's not. Something is not genuine about it. And there are some options here, which I'll rank kind of from the most innocent, non-genuine explanation to the most malevolent, non-genuine explanation. Okay. Uh, probably the most, the most innocent is it was, it was imagination. You know, these are kids, they're young, they're not educated, they're not, they're, you know, Maximin's only 11 and they're out and they're kind of fantasizing and, you know, they think about and they convince themselves that they've seen the Virgin Mary, kind of like some people convince themselves they've seen a UFO, even when they haven't. You know, it is possible for people to talk themselves into thinking they've had a really cool experience that really was a product of their imagination. And they're not deliberately trying to deceive anybody. It's, it's innocent. It's just an innocent thing. Then there's the possibility that the children were innocent, but someone else was deceiving them. Someone was playing a prank on them. You'll remember there was there were allegations about this woman named Le Merlier, that she was responsible for this. So we have to list that as a possibility here. Then it could be that the kids weren't innocent, that this was a hoax, 
You know, you have these kids, they're young, they're immature, they're not good in school. And also, they didn't have good relationships with their families, either one of them, especially Melanie. And so it could be, you know, they didn't try to make money out of this, but it could be a bid to get attention or respect. You know, these are low, these are lower class kids. They're uneducated cowherds. They don't get a lot of props. And if you then become a religious visionary, you're going to get a lot more respect. Hmm. And so it could, you know, yeah, that's a possibility, too, that has to be considered. Then the most malevolent is they were deceived by demons. There's also now. So the two basic possibilities with an apparition are it's either genuine or it's not. But there's also a third possibility, which is it's a mix. Perhaps there's something that was a genuinely heavenly apparition here that then got amplified by imagination or hoax, the way Melanie in later years seems to have amplified her secret to where even the La Salette missionaries say, don't look at that later stuff, look at the original 1846 stuff. So there's this mixed apparition possibility as well. I, I want to take a second and just ask you a question. When when does this occur in relation to Lourdes, which is another apparition that happened in France? This is before Lourdes. But just before, right? Like 1850, wasn't it? I, I, I don't want to say without looking it up, okay. just to verify my memory. <laughs> but this is the apparition that really kicked off the modern apparition series in Europe. And it's also the first one that where you had this personal secret stuff happen. Okay. Okay. That's that, I thought that was interesting. I just quickly checked. Lords was 1858. So a little more mm -hmm. than a decade later. All right. So yeah. what, what can we say about this event at La Salette from the reason perspective? It depends on what you consider reason. Uh, skeptics, uh, meaning like, you know, materialists, atheistic skepticism, they would say that reason precludes any possibility of the supernatural, or frequently they would say that. And that would thus preclude any possibility of this being a genuine apparition. But frankly, that's anti-supernatural prejudice. A person with an open mind won't decide in advance that the supernatural doesn't exist or that it does. A person with an open mind will be open to where the evidence leads. If you prejudge a matter and without looking at the before you look at the evidence, say it must be this way or that, that's the definition of prejudice to prejudge a situation. Right. And so a rational, open minded person will say, well, we'll be open here. We'll look at the evidence, say, does it point to something natural or something supernatural? If it points to something supernatural, then that's evidence the supernatural exists. If it doesn't point to something supernatural, well, in this case, we don't have evidence that the supernatural exists. From this case, there might be others. However, I should note that the existence of the supernatural does not depend on La Salette. Uh, one could conclude that La Salette was entirely natural. And in fact, the Catholic Encyclopedia mentioned that a lot of French ecclesiastics did before the bishop's decision. But the same ecclesiastics would say, okay, but there are other genuine supernatural incidents that we can more clearly demonstrate. So the supernatural doesn't depend on La Salette. Whatever you think about La Salette, the question of the supernatural can be established on other grounds. So that's the reason perspective. Then what can we say about this from the faith perspective? The first thing we need to say is that La Salette, like all reported private revelations, is not a matter of faith. According to Joseph Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict XVI, in his theological commentary in a document from the Vatican called The Message of Fatima, The authority of private revelations is essentially different from that of the definitive public revelation. The latter demands faith. In it, in fact, God himself speaks to us through human words and the meditation of the living community of the church. Ecclesiastical approval of a private revelation has three elements. The message contains nothing contrary to faith or morals. It is lawful to make it public, and the faithful are authorized to accept it with prudence. So Catholics can thus have a diversity of opinion regarding apparitions. Uh, we are open to them in principle, but is this one a genuine one or not? That's a matter on which you can legitimately differ with each other. So the church doesn't mandate you buy this. It just says it's if it approves an apparition, it says, OK, this doesn't have anything contrary to faith or moral, so it's not heretical. The bishop is given permission to make it public and you're authorized to accept it with prudence. 
but not with faith. It's worth noting that in 1854, the Bishop of Birmingham, England, uh, William Ullathorne, issued a book called The Holy Mountain of La Salette. And so this is like less than a decade. This is eight years after the apparition. And even he, he's a big fan of La Salette. And we'll have a link to his book in the show notes so you can get it for yourself. But he is, he's a big fan. He's convinced of La Salette. But even he acknowledges that, that there's this diversity of opinion concerning private revelations. He says, The particular instances in which this divine intervention is exercised are left free for the examination and the criticism of the individual members of the church to be received and believed or not according to the evidence. Yet there are certain of these manifestations of the divine goodness which, from the eminence of the authority which is pronounced upon them, from their universal acceptance, and from the piety and devotion which have grown out of them, acquire the highest characteristics of ecclesiastical faith. And to call these lightly in question would be both rash and offensive to pious ears. The fact of La Salette has not attained to this high degree of authority. Right. So he's saying even La Salette itself is not one of these big historically accepted things. And it, it certainly wasn't in his day. It just happened eight years earlier. But he's acknowledging you you don't have to believe this. You can call it into question if you think the evidence points the other way. It's not doesn't make you a bad Catholic. You're not being rash or offensive to pious ears by calling it into question. So that how does the magisterium go about discerning whether an apparition is genuine? Normally, it's the local bishop that conducts an investigation and issues a determination, although higher authorities can be involved. The criteria have varied over time. The current criteria were set out in 1978 in a document by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and it's meant as a kind of background document for bishops to help them evaluate apparitions in their own territory. Originally, and for a long time, it was a secret. It wasn't publicly published, but it leaked. And over time, it got out onto websites, including JimmyAiken.com and somehow. <laughs> and uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith eventually decided to publish it a few years ago. So now everybody can read it. We'll be using this 1978 document in our look at La Salette. This is partially because I don't have access to a list of official criteria that were used in the 1840s, if they're even was an official set of criteria then, but also doctrinal development has taken place, you know, in the last 180 years, 170 years. And so we'd want to take a look at La Salette in light of the present criteria anyway, to reflect that doctrinal development. All right. So then what criteria would indicate that an apparition is genuine? Two of the criteria that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith lists are theological accuracy and spiritual fruit being produced in the wake of an apparition. But just because an apparition doesn't contain theological error doesn't mean it's supernatural. So this is more of a precondition. It has to be theologically accurate, but that's not a positive proof because anyone who knows their catechism can say stuff that's theologically accurate. Similarly, with regard to spiritual fruit, you know, people can get inspired to pray and repent by reported miracles, even if they're not real. For example, back in the 1960s and 70s, there was a Pentecostal evangelist named Marjo Gortner. We may talk about him in the future because he 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 used uh, he, there's kind of a bit of a mystery around him because he would use stage tricks. As part of his religious revival, he would use magician's tricks to fake miracles. Hmm. Like he had this powder he would put on his head in the form of a cross. And when he would start preaching and he would sweat, the powder would turn red and people would see this bloody cross appear on his forehead as he's preaching, which he then wipes off. So he then made a documentary about himself and outed himself as a fake. <laughs> You know, but people did go to his revivals and get fired up and they would repent of sins and they would, you know, worship God. And so you can have spiritual fruit coming from something where the minister's motives are not sincere. This is something St. Paul talks about in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. He says he rejoices that Christ is preached, whether the minister has good motives or bad because even when people preach Jesus from bad motives, it can still lead people to Jesus. Spiritual fruit is a, a nice confirmation, but it's not a positive proof that you have a supernatural event. The first and most important of the criteria 
that the 1978 document has is moral certitude or at least great probability of the existence of the fact, meaning the apparition, acquired by means of a serious investigation. So th what that means is you've got serious evidence that this really happened. It really was a genuine supernatural event. And to achieve certitude or even a great probability that that's the case, you need some kind of solid evidence that something supernatural, something beyond the ordinary course of nature took place. All right. So then we know that the local bishop approved the La Salette apparition. So what evidence did he have that something supernatural took place? Well, you'll recall that the public message of the apparition predicted the failure of certain crops, and it's reported that that actually happened, at least locally in that area of France. Also, as word of the apparition spread, various healings were attributed either to the intercession of Our Lady of La Salette or to a miraculous healing spring on the mountain where it occurred. At least one cure was verified as miraculous by the Bishop of the Diocese of Sens, or Sen, however you say that. And so, you know, there was some basis for saying, I don't, I don't have a lot of details on these, unfortunately, but at the time they looked at him and said, yeah, this looks like a miracle. And that supports the idea that something genuinely supernatural happened here. If it was a supernatural event, though, that doesn't mean it was necessarily from God. Are, are there any reasons to see the work of demons in this? I don't see any reasons. The public message of La Salette was to pr not profane Sundays or the Lord's name, so don't violate the second and third commandments. That's not the kind of thing demons are going to typically be interested in recommending to people. They tend to recommend the opposite, if anything. And there was spiritual fruit that followed the event with people uh, repenting and drawing closer to God. Well, in that case, are there arguments against La Salette being a genuine apparition? One of the 1978 criteria the CDF listed as being in favor of an apparition is, quote, personal qualities of the subject or of the subjects, in particular, psychological equilibrium, honesty and rectitude of moral life, sincerity and habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority, the capacity to return to a normal regimen of a life of faith, etc., Close quote. So conversely, if the seers the, who report the apparition, if they don't display psychological equilibrium, habitual docility towards ecclesiastical authority, or the capacity to return to a normal regimen of a life of faith, that would seem to count against the authenticity of the apparition. And here we encounter a realm that can be controversial because there are both positive and negative evaluations of the children. Uh, some writings speak very highly of them, although even these admit flaws in the children's characters, especially of Melanie, and that raises concerns. And there are certain just objectively verifiable facts about their later careers that raise concerns. Neither child lived a stable life once they grew to adulthood. Melanie, in particular, was drawn into repeated conflicts with the ecclesiastical authorities. She wasn't docile to them. She moved from one religious community to another, and she published a sensationalistic version of her secret that was condemned by the Vatican itself. Hmm. So these, you know, these aren't proof that the apparition wasn't genuine because seers have free will. They can, even if they have a genuine apparition at one point in their life, they can go off the rails later. But that these characteristics of their later lives don't raise a lot of confidence that that the apparition was genuine. Are there any other arguments against the apparition? Well, we mentioned earlier the idea that someone might have played a prank on him, and that was charged by critics of the apparition. Uh, the person they held responsible was a woman named Constance Lemerlier. And there are several public domain books about this in French, but unfortunately, not much seems to be available in English. So I haven't been able to get a lot of the facts on this. The most extensive English language account I found is from a 19th century writer named George Salmon, who was, or Salmon, but I assume it's Salmon. He was an, an Anglican who was critical of the Catholic faith. He wrote a book called The Infallibility of the Church, and in it he mentioned Lamerlier, and he said this. It was asserted that the virgin who appeared to the children was a certain Constance Lamerlier, a nun, half knave, half crazy, who could be proved to have purchased the dress in which the virgin appeared, and whose connection with the apparition could in other ways be proved. 
This was stated so persistently that Constance Lamer Lamerlier was forced to accept the challenge and bring an action for defamation of character, but the court decided against her, and the decision was confirmed on appeal. So I'm not sure what to make of this. On one hand, Salmon is a critic of the church, but on the other hand, that doesn't mean he can't accurately state the facts of the case as they were found by the French courts. Similarly, on the one hand, the investigator the investigations conducted by the court by courts are, you know, generally to be relied upon. We don't systematically distrust the legal system. But on the other hand, this was an anti clerical French court. I don't know what to make of this court situation without further access to detailed evidence concerning the Constance Lemerlier case. Also, though, even if Lemerlier did, say, buy this dress and impersonate the Virgin Mary to these children, it wouldn't explain everything they reported. They reported seeing the Virgin Mary surrounded by intensely bright light and seeing her float above the ground. Like, she didn't walk. She floated above the ground. And then eventually she rose upward and disappeared in this great burst of light. A woman in a dress wouldn't be able to do those things without, you know, superpowers. A purely natural explanation, if you want to say this was just purely natural and Constance Le Merlier was involved, you got to have something going on with the kids, too, either imagination or deception or something on their part as well, if you want to say this is all just natural. Did the children ever recant their claims about the apparition? They continue to affirm them strongly for the rest of their lives, with one possible exception. Uh, earlier, we read a passage from the Catholic Encyclopedia that mentioned what it called the uh, incident of Ars. That's a reference to a time when Maximin met St. John Vianney, the curé d'Ars, in 1850. He was 15 years old at the time. And he he had a couple conversations with St. John Vianney, and the saint thought that Maximin admitted to him that he had lied about seeing the Virgin Mary in 1846. That was apparently Vianney's impression of what Maximin said hmm. to him. He was reportedly hard of hearing at this point. Uh, he wasn't completely deaf, but he was somewhat hard of hearing. And Maximin later said that he had admitted to the saint that he lied on other occasions, but not about the apparition, and that Vianney misunderstood what he was saying. He thought the admission that he had lied about other things as a boy meant that he had lied about this, and he didn't say that. Afterwards, Vianney apparently said that he may have misunderstood Maximin, and he later did endorse La Salette. It seems to me from reading things that he he signed that he was maybe a little tepid about La Salette, but he certainly didn't oppose it later on. So in view of this, the safe assumption in evaluating this evidence is to say it was just a misunderstanding and the children's otherwise unbroken testimony that, yes, we really saw this back then is to be uh, is to be taken at face value. They never recanted. Did the children ever say anything to other people about their secrets? At first, very little. But with time, both of them began to say things that we know are now are not part of the secrets. Maximin apparently told others a bunch of really fanciful stuff, like he's going to become the prime minister. And he, Maximin, is going to become the prime minister and later the king of France, even though he's this uneducated cowherd farm boy. And he's going to be a millionaire. And then the Antichrist is going to come and the Antichrist is going to kill Maximin. And that's how he's going to die. It's generally thought that he just made this stuff up to get people to stop bugging him. <laughs> so, so it's like, you keep asking me about this. Okay, well, guess what? I'm going to be a millionaire and the Antichrist is going to kill me. Melanie, on the other hand, began disclosing parts of what she said was in the secret to various people over the, over the course of time. And that culminated in 1878 when she published uh, what was supposed to be a complete edition of The Secret, but it contained things that were not in the original because it was way too long. The original was written on three sheets of paper, handwritten, and the published 1879 version was much longer than that. In stepping back and saying, well, what does this tell us about the credibility of all this? It doesn't disprove anything about the original apparition, but on the other hand, it's not a good sign if mm. both of the seers are later making stuff up, whether just to get people to leave them alone or because they become disturbed in their imagination. 
later on. It's not a good sign for the original incident if they're both like later making stuff up. So what can you tell us about this 1879 version of Melanie's Secret? Well, as we've noted, it was published with the permission of her local bishop, but it was later that was yanked and it was put on the index of forbidden books by the Vatican. It was, as I mentioned, conspicuously longer than the one that was published in 1851. It couldn't have fit on just three sheets of handwritten paper. It was very sensationalistic, and that actually brought a great deal of disrepute at the time to the apparition. Even supporters of La Salette, like the La Salette missionaries, distanced themselves from this version of the message. And it's generally been concluded that, you know, Melanie kind of became unhinged in her later years and made a bunch of it up. What's what is sensationalistic about this 1879 version of her secret? A bunch of things. And we'll have a link in the show notes so you can read it for yourself. The most famous sensationalistic thing in it is the claim that Rome will. This is a direct quote. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. Now, some traditionalists try to link that to events in the Catholic Church today, like Rome has lost the faith and the Pope is the Antichrist or something. That really can't be sustained for a bunch of reasons. And I actually wrote an article on that subject back in the year 2000 showing why those claims don't work. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes. But also, we know this claim is not in the original. It's something Melanie came up with later. Also, the 1879 version of The Secret makes a bunch of predictions that demonstrably did not happen. For example, she said that the Antichrist would be born around the year 1865, and that by the age of 12 years old, he and his brothers would win valiant military victories and soon be put at the heads of armies. Needless to say, the Antichrist was not born around 1865. And there were no 12-year-old military leaders winning valiant battles in the 1870s or 80s. So it just didn't happen. Fortunately, we now have the original texts of both Maximin and Melanie's secrets. So how were those rediscovered? In October of 1999, Father Michael Cortville found them in the Vatican archives. And so we now know what they said. Well, yeah, let's take a look at Maximin's secret. Okay, so Maximin Secret says this. If my people continue, what I will say to you will arrive earlier. If it changes a little, it will be a little later. France has corrupted the universe. One day it will be punished. The faith will die out in France. Three quarters of France will not practice religion anymore or almost no more. The other part will practice it without really practicing it. Then after that, nations will convert. The faith will be rekindled everywhere. A great country, now Protestant in the north of Europe, will be converted. By the support of this country, all the other nations of the world will be converted. Before all that arrives, great disorders will arrive in the church and everywhere. Then, after that, our Holy Father the Pope will be persecuted. His successor will be a pontiff that nobody expects. Then, after that, a great peace will come. But it will not last a long time. A monster will come to disturb it. All that I tell you here will arrive in the other century at the latest in the year 2000. Okay, so Maximin's secret has the following elements. There are going to be great disorders in the church and the world. A pope will be persecuted and his successor will be an unexpected choice. The Catholic faith will largely cease to be practiced in France. A great Protestant country in Northern Europe will convert to Catholicism. That country's conversion will trigger the conversion of multiple other nations There will be a great but brief period of peace, and a monster will come to disturb it, presumably meaning a war. All right, so now let's look at Melanie's secret. Okay, Melanie's secret says this. The time of the gods' wrath has arrived. If, when you say to the people what I have said to you so far, and what I will still ask you to say, if after that they do not convert, if they do not do penance, and they do not cease working on Sunday, and if they continue to blaspheme the holy name of God, in a word, if the face of the earth does not change, God will be avenged against the people ungrateful and slave of the demon. My son will make his power manifest. Paris, the city soiled by all kinds of crimes, will perish infallibly. Marseille will be destroyed in a little time. When these things arrive, the disorder will be complete on the earth. The world will be given up to its impious passions. The Pope will be persecuted from all sides. They will shoot at him. They will want to put him to death. But no one will be able to do it. The vicar of God will triumph again this time. The priests and the sisters and the true servants of my son will be persecuted. 
and several will die for the faith of Jesus Christ. A famine will reign at the same time. After all these will have arrived, many will recognize the hand of God on them. They will convert and do penance for their sins. A great king will go up on the throne and will reign a few years. Religion will reflourish and spread all over the world, and there will be a great abundance. The world, glad not to be lacking nothing, will fall again in its disorders, will give up God, and will be prone to its criminal passions. Among God's ministers and the spouses of Jesus Christ, there will be some who will go astray, and that will be the most terrible. Lastly, hell will reign on earth. It will be then that the Antichrist will be born of a sister. But woe to her! Many will believe in him, because he will claim to have come from heaven. Woe to those who will believe in him! That time is not far away. Twice fifty years will not go by. Okay, so Melanie's secret contained the following elements. Unless people repent, Paris and Marseille are going to be destroyed soon. There will be disorder and immoral living on earth. The Pope will be persecuted. People will try, will shoot at him and try to kill him, but won't. Priests and sisters will be persecuted and some will be martyred. There's going to be a famine, but people are going to convert. There will be a time of great religion and prosperity under a great king, but it won't last. Some priests and sisters will go astray, and then hell is going to reign on earth. The Antichrist is going to be born of a nun he's, uh, he, or a sister. He's going to claim to have come from heaven, and many people will believe in him. So what can we make of the two secrets by comparing them to each other? They both seem to cover the same ground in general terms. There are differences in the details, but the there are six basic elements that each of them has. The first is there's going to be a time of great disorder. Uh, Maximum said there will be great disorders in the church and the world. Melanie said that unless people repent, Paris and Marseille are going to be destroyed and there's going to be a famine. The second is there's going to be a persecution of the pope. Maximin said a pope will be persecuted and his successor will be an unexpected choice. Melanie said the pope will be persecuted and that people will shoot at and try to kill him but not succeed, although they will succeed in persecuting and martyring some priests and sisters. The third element is that there will be a weakening of the Catholic faith in some areas. Maximin said the Catholic faith will largely cease to be practiced in France. And Melanie said that some priests and sisters will go astray from the faith. In uh, the fourth element is that there are going to be conversions, though. Maximin said a great Protestant country in Northern Europe will convert to Catholicism and bring about the conversion of multiple other nations. Melanie said that some people will convert following the chastisements, she predicted. Then there's this, uh, the fifth one is there's a prediction of a time of peace. Maximin said it'll be brief, but it'll be a really good peace. Melanie said that there will be a time of great religion and prosperity under a great king but it won't last. And then finally, both of them deal with the Antichrist. Maximin said that a monster will come to disturb the time of peace, and Melanie said the Antichrist will be born to a sister, he'll claim to have come from heaven, and many people will believe in him. The fact that even though the details are a little different, both secrets contain all six elements suggests that they came from a common source, whether that's the Virgin Mary or Constance Lemerlier or the children, they have a common source, and they should be read in light of each other. So what can we say about the degree to which they were fulfilled then? We first need to identify the time frame in which they're supposed to be fulfilled, so we can look at that time frame and see what happened. Fortunately, both seers gave us a time frame. Maximin said that his secret would be fulfilled a little sooner if people continued without repenting or a little later if they did repent, but he said that it would be fulfilled in the other century, and so he's saying that in the 19th century, so he means the 20th century, and at the latest, so even if people do repent, it'll, it'll be fulfilled by the year 2000 at the latest. So definitely we should look for the bulk of the fulfillment in the 20th century, maybe with some of it in the 19th. Melanie said that it would happen before twice 50 years go by. So that would be from 1846, that would be 1946, uh, judging by the date of the apparition. So do we see these th any of these things happening in that time frame? Uh, some of the things that they predict are common in all periods of history. There are always wars and famines and periods of peace. It's, I mean, if you look at a hundred year stretch, there are going to be wars and famines and periods of peace in there. On the religious front, there are also always periods of immorality, including among the priests and religious, and there are periods of persecution and there are periods of conversion. You look at any sufficiently long stretch of history, you're going to be able to find those things. 
And certainly in a period of 100 to 100, 150 years like this, you're going to see those. We would expect to see multiple things you could claim as fulfillments. Uh, for example, l even some of the more specific things, like the Pope's going to be persecuted. Okay, off the top of my head, I can think of three popes that lived in, without doing any research, I can think of three popes that would seem to fit that. Pius IX was persecuted by Italian nationalists. Pius XII was persecuted by Nazis. John Paul II was persecuted by Soviets. And each of their successors, in accord with Maximin's prediction that there would be an unexpected uh, successor, each of their successors could be considered in various ways unexpected. Leo XIII was nowhere near as conservative as Pius the Ninth. He was a liberal by comparison. John the Twenty Third was very different than Pius the 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 Twelfth. He ended up calling the Second Vatican Council, among other things. It was not expected at this time. And uh, Benedict XVI was, you know, only the second non-Italian pope in centuries, and he was a former member compulsorily. He didn't want to be one, but they forced him to, like everybody. He was a former member of the Hitler Youth. So you could, I, even the more specific stuff, like there's going to be a pope who's persecuted, has an unexpected successor. That happened, you could argue, for three fulfillments of that in this period. So we need to look at some really much more specific claims if we're going to have evidence here of something beyond random chance. Okay, then what about these specific claims? It's tempting to look at Melanie's prophecy of the destruction of Paris and Marseille as being fulfilled in either the Franco-Prussian War or World War I or World War II. But I did some checking, and while both cities suffered damage in these wars, they weren't destroyed, and the damage was quickly repaired each time. Also, in World War II, France fell so quickly that Paris surrendered and the, to the Germans, and it remained the de jure, or in-law, capital of France during the war under Nazi authority. So this prediction about Paris and Marseille has kind of a dubious fulfillment. On the other hand, the prophecy also seems contingent on if people repent or not. You know, she said, if people don't repent, Paris and Marseille are going to be destroyed. But you could say, well, they did repent, perhaps even due to La Salette itself, because we know there was a religious revival in some parts of France. Maybe that averted the uh, destruction of Paris and Marseille. The one prediction that really is just bang on is Maximin was certainly right that the faith would dramatically diminish in France, and that did happen by the year 2000. So this is a clear, that is clearly an on-target prediction. Are there predictions that look like they weren't fulfilled? Yeah. Melanie's prophecy of a time of great religion and prosperity after, quote, a great king will go up on the throne, close quote, is doubtful. In context, the throne would presumably refer to the throne of France. At the time, I mean, if you're in a land that has a king and you say there's going to be a new king on the throne, you mean the king of your own country. At the time, France was ruled by a king as part of the July monarchy. It was King Louis-Philippe. And Melanie herself was a royalist who later spoke out against the secular French state. But there never was a great king of France after where there's this big period of prosperity and religion. I mean, at least you can argue that. The only king after Louis Philippe, and even he wasn't immediate, but the only king, subsequent king was Napoleon III. And it doesn't look like he had a great reign of religion and prosperity. In fact, Pope, on the religious front, Pope Pius IX called him a liar and a cheat. And he was constantly involved in wars, which are not what you want for prosperity. However, Melanie didn't explicitly say it was going to be a king of France, so you could say maybe it's some other country in Europe. Uh, but it's hard to think of another great king in that who had a great period of religion and prosperity between 1846 and 1946. Uh, so this one doesn't really look like it happened. Maximin's prediction that a great country in Northern Europe would convert from Protestantism, from Protestantism to Catholicism, that clearly did not happen. The great country in Northern Europe would presumably either be Germany or Britain, but neither became Catholic. And in fact, no country in Europe went from Protestantism to Catholicism in the 20th century. And he said all this would happen by the year 2000 at the latest. 
neither did any newly converted Protestant nation lead to the conversion of multiple other countries, or even as Maximin in his own words said, quote, all the other nations of the world, close quote, would convert. And that didn't happen. Finally, Melanie's prediction about the Antichrist coming didn't happen. The most clearly Antichrist-like figure in this period was Adolf Hitler, but he wasn't born to a sister. His mother, Clara Paltzel Hitler, came, became a household servant of her relative, Alois Hitler, at like age 16 and married him. So she didn't come from a, a monastery. Hitler also didn't claim to be from heaven. He had this kind of secular religion, and he certainly didn't claim to be come from heaven the way Jesus was. And in, in the end, he wasn't the Antichrist. This prediction looks like it simply wasn't fulfilled. So what are we to make of the seeming non-fulfillment of these predictions? Well, there are a few possibilities. Uh, one is these predictions came f uh, to the children as a result of deception that Constance Le Merlier made them up and then told them to both children individually. Another is they somehow invented themselves, invented them themselves, or they, and this is something that the 1978 apparition criteria mention. it is possible and in fact happens where even a genuine seer may introduce something into what they think they've received just based on a mistake or imagination or something. And so you could say, well, there's an admixture of human here, of ideas that did come from the children from their imagination, and they mistook for divine revelation. Then you could argue that, well, maybe these just have a really delayed fulfillment, despite the fact they both said it's going to happen in these time frames, and maybe maybe for some reason the time frames were the element that the kid's imagination came up with, or God changed his mind. Which leads to the last kind of possibility, which is prophetic cancellation. Jeremiah, if you look in Jeremiah 18, verses 7 to 10, God talks about the things that, uh, talks about if he like declares doom on a city for its sins, and then that city repents, he's going to call off the doom. And similarly, if he says there's going to be prosperity for a city and the city falls into sin, he's going to call off the prosperity. So prophetic cancellation is a thing. But in this case, it's hard to square why God would cancel these doom prophecies if people didn't repent, as the 20th century shows they didn't. Right. So it's hard to see a basis for prophetic cancellation here. Whatever explanation one prefers, the failure of the predictions raises significant questions about the apparition. All right, Jimmy. So here we go. What is your bottom line? My approach is to start with deference to the local ecclesiastical authorities. So based on the 1851 decision, I'd be inclined to accept La Salette as genuine. In fact, in the past, I've always assumed that the La Salette apparition was genuine, even knowing that Melanie later added some stuff. I thought, okay, well, she just got a little disturbed afterwards, but the church had, must have had good evidence for what it said in 1851, and so I'm going with that. But in researching this episode, it's raised new questions for me about the apparition. We know more now about the apparition than was known when the decision was made in 1851. Uh, this includes knowing the subsequent lives of the seers, including the particularly troubled career of Melanie. She was, you know, like 21 at the time, and or 20 or 21 at the time. And so her future career was still all in the future. They didn't know about what she was going to do. It, we also know today what the original secret said and how they contained dated prophecies that it's going to happen by this date that just didn't happen. And they didn't know that was not going to happen in 1851. And then there's the apparent court case of Constance Le Merlier, who couldn't prove that she was being defamed in allegations that she was behind the apparition. So my bottom line is in this particular case, I don't know what to think. It could have been a genuine supernatural event with a notable admixture of ideas from the consciousness of the of the seers, or it could have a natural explanation. I, I, I don't know what to think here. I am, though, much more positive about other apparitions like Fatima, which we'll be discussing next month when we talk about its third secret, which we have very good evidence for. Right. It's our, and which we've already talked about uh, Fatima a few months ago. Uh, I'm talking about it again. So, that's yeah, good. All right. A, a, this is a difficult topic, uh, especially when you, we come up with a bottom line that is, we, we would love to be 
positive uh, about this, but uh, you know, it 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 seems clear that you know as the usual, facts don't let us yeah. be as positive as we might like. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Now, I want to stress the current status of this apparition in terms of church approval. Once a ruling has been issued on whether an apparition occurred, the church doesn't like do a periodic review of that status. And so since the original secrets were found in the Vatican archives, the church hasn't relooked at the La Salette issue. The original apparition is still approved for the faithful to accept with prudence. It doesn't contradict doctrines of the faith and the local authorities 1851 ruling that the original 1846 event may be regarded as supernatural is still in place. Uh, all right, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer the listeners? So uh, one is Bishop Ollithorne's book, The Holy Mountain of La Salette. And as I mentioned, it was written in the 1850s, and he's a big fan of La Salette. So he's going to make you know a good case for La Salette from a pro-La Salette point of view. So you can check out his book. Also, we have a book by Sandra Zimdar Schwartz called Encountering Mary. I ran across this book a number of years ago, and it's a really balanced objective treatment of multiple Marian apparitions. She's not writing from a particularly faith perspective. She's like a historian who's writing from a neutral perspective and just trying to present the facts as clearly as possible and explain what they mean from for Catholics. And so her book, Encountering Mary, we'll have a link to that. We'll have a link to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's 1978 document on evaluating apparitions. We'll have the Vatican document, The Message of Fatima, which we quoted uh, Joseph Ratzinger from. We'll have the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on La Salette, We'll have Wikipedia's article on Our Lady of La Salette, on Melanie Calvat, and on Maxim Girard. Uh, also, we'll have the Shrine of Our Lady of La Salette's website and the Missionaries of La Salette, as well as the Original Secrets of La Salette. The SSPXAsia.com website has not only, it, it's really nicely done. I mean, I don't, you know, agree with all their commentary on them, but in terms of presenting the secrets, they've got like photocopies of the original handwriting along with transcripts of the original French, including the children's spelling mistakes because they didn't know how to spell, and an English translation. And so you can see all of that together. You can look and say, yeah, okay, this word is in the handwriting, in, and if you run it through Google Translate, you're going to get approximately what's in the English version. So you can check that out for yourself. Then I'll have a link to the 1879 modified version of Melanie's Secret so you can see how she changed it. And then also we'll have a link to my article, La Salette, Sorting Fact from Fiction, where I talk about the Rome will become, will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist stuff and why that doesn't hold water. All right. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Yeah, that uh, check out all those resources, folks. Uh, there's, there's some good stuff there. This is Dom Bettinelli of the StarQuest Production Network, and we need your help. Over the past year, we've grown by leaps and bounds. Some of our podcasts, like Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, are among the most popular shows we've ever produced. But that success is in danger. Creating a dozen shows has caused our expenses to rise, and right now, we aren't making ends meet. We must reach the financial break-even point if we're going to continue. If our reserves are depleted, we'll have to cut back many of our shows. We might have to shut down entirely. That's why it's crucial we hear from you right now now. Please go to sqpn.com slash give and click the become a patron button to make your monthly pledge. If you're already a supporter, please consider increasing your pledge. The need is urgent, so please go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. All right, let's move on to our mysterious feedback for this week. Uh, we'll be talking about feedback from our episode on hypnosis. Uh, and David Arcudi writes on YouTube as a question, very simple question. So it it is all fake? I, I don't want to say that. I think, and you can go back and check out the hypnosis episode, but I think that hypnosis is a socially learned role where people basically relax and focus their attention on something and go along with instructions. So I, I think it's I, I think it's basically equivalent to relaxing and following instructions and concentrating. If there is, I can't, though, say that there is no altered state of true altered state of consciousness that happens here. But if so, it's not as common or as powerful as people think. Brooke Kennel writes on YouTube. 
Some of the features of hypnosis, especially rigid bodies and lack of awareness of external stimuli, remind me of mystics when they're in trances. Could there be a connection? Oh, yeah. I think that trances are related to hypnosis. I think down through history, some instances of what people will say are trances are effectively the same thing. I also, though, think that some trances go beyond ordinary hypnosis because you do get things in some trances that, like, for example, if people are taking magic mushrooms, that's gonna they're going to have a different kind of trance experience than just relaxing and concentrating. Also, some uh, sometimes mystics are actually in touch with the divine, and that's going to have other effects as well. But I think there is an overlap in these phenomena. Uh, Deviant Spark One on YouTube writes: If you do some action in a dream that conflicts with your morals, does that mean you could be hypnotized to do it? Also, no. And uh, hypnosis people, even people who favor the altered state of consciousness view, will say you cannot be hypnotized to do something you wouldn't ordinarily do. If you are doing something in your dreams that's different, it's because we're not in command of our faculties in a dream the way we are when we're awake or when we're hypnotized. From my perspective, the non-state hypothesis that hypnosis is not an altered state of consciousness, it's just relaxing and focusing, well, therefore, it's not sleep. So you wouldn't be in a dream state in hypnosis anyway, and thus what you do in a dream wouldn't apply to hypnosis. Plus, in a dream, you're not actually doing it, and your subconscious would know that you're not actually engaging in an immoral act. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? People may be aware that we have a black hole, a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's called Sagittarius A-star. And we can image it through telescopes and we can see stuff swirling around it and occasionally going into it. And it just unleashed the biggest flare we've ever seen it emit. Fortunately, it did that 20,000 years ago. Okay. But <laughs> um, but it's been making news in the science and astronomy world. So you might want to check that out. And also, it's a nice chance to learn more about the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. I just I just love watching little image tracks of the things orbiting it. Um, <laughs> and we can see it even though it's 20,000 light years away. Also, we'll have a link to a, another article on the ghost hunter defense being used in an English burglary case. So uh, in a town in England where there's a reputation for a lot of hauntings, some guys got caught in a house apparently burglarizing it and they said, oh, no. We're just ghost hunters. We had to break <laughs> in to study the ghostly phenomena. <laughs> that, that is the lamest alibi. <laughs> it's like the, the Twinkie defense, yeah, yeah, or the Chewbacca defense. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the Scooby-Doo defense. <laughs> All right, Jimmy, uh, in a second, I'm going to ask you what we'll be uh, talking about on our next episode next week. But first, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Terry R., Teresa N., Samuel C., Ian S., and Nick W. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, Jimmy, what is our topic next week? Next week, we're going to be talking about the Betty and Barney Hill UFO event that kicked off the modern wave of abductions. Interesting. Excellent. I know we've been looking forward to that one. So that's it from us. So what did you think about this uh, discussion of the apparition of La Salette? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Be sure to share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. That helps us grow this community of listeners and reaches more people with this this excellent show. That helps the show continue, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, You can find links to all of Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.